Hello, everybody. Welcome. Happy Earth Day. Yay! Let's hear it for the planet. And I know a lot of people are converging um, in cities uh, all around the world today, including San Francisco, to March for Science. Um, and um, I am uh, sure that many of you are marching in your in your minds, um, and that is is is. I can hear the footfalls. I can hear the beat of your feet. Um, and I feel that what we're doing here um, is also an important show of force um, and, um, and conviction. Uh, and you will see, um, although the research that we do is sometimes not scientific, um, it is equally impactful. And I want to address the um, members of the 2017 graduating cohort because we're here today to celebrate your success. And I hope that you'll savor this moment, um, the culmination of years of effort. You've earned your academic credentials from one of the only colleges in the country to offer a dual degree that combines rigorous scholarship with creative practice. And you had the courage to commit to pursuing your, what, what they call here, second degree. Um, I call it sometimes the third degree um, in a discipline whose practical advantages are not immediately apparent, visual and critical studies. But the relevance of this area of interrogation, I'm sure you'll agree, has been convincingly demonstrated by the program's students, alumni, faculty. You undertook your studies at CCA in a different era. Barack Obama was the president of the United States. During his regime, we made significant steps towards universal health coverage. Marriage equality became the law of the land. We ratified COP21, the Paris Climate Agreement, and many of us believed that policy commitments to social, economic, and environmental justice could and would reshape our culture. You're completing your degree requirements in an entirely different environment, one where each of us is called on to defend civil, that is to say human, rights we never expected to see challenged anew, let alone trammeled. Daily, we are confronted with new edicts that oppress some to the advantage of others and ravage the most vulnerable among us. At the annual conference convocation of the College Art Association, the country's largest professional organization for artists, art historians, and curators, the keynote speaker stressed the close connections between art making and activism affirming the vital roles that scholars and makers of art play in addressing the critical issues of the day, income disparity, racism, sexism, immigration, and all forms of discrimination and ethical derogation. Art matters, in other words. Art serves as an arena not only of engagement and resistance, advocacy and education, problem solving and invention, but also as a vital means of opening up and re-envisioning the world around us. Given escalating threats to the humanities and the arts, not to mention sciences, the assault on the National Endowment of the Arts, National Endowment of the Humanities, Environmental Protection Agency, etc., it is clear that mattering, the materialization of alternative ideals is of paramount importance. Performing care and commitment in creative and critical ways matters. Denouncing racism, classism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, ableism, climate change denial, and anti-immigrant campaigns matters. Combating anti-intellectualism, given the scope and urgency of this long list of imperatives, might not seem like a top priority for newly minted college and graduate school graduates. 
But we need your critical thinking faculties, your mental agility, your intellectual rigor, your stamina, your knowledge, and your commitment to learning in order to forge alliances and galvanize effective, sustained action in the face of these challenges. We must all learn and teach with even more conviction now and reach out farther beyond our campuses, beyond city, state, and national borders. We have the capacity as visual scholars, critics, and culture makers to understand and reconfigure the visual operations of power, nothing less. We must speak out, stand up, bear witness, make visible that which is invisible, trouble with our making, our writing and speaking and research, naturalized assumptions about what is valuable and true. We must roll up our sleeves and do what we've been trained to do and what we do best, to do it with more conviction than ever. That's our job. Your work, cohort of 2017, carries forward the ethical commitments and critical standards that have hallmarked visual and critical studies since the program's inception. At CCA, you have learned nothing less than new ways to see and new ways to envision the world. I know I speak for the VCS faculty, advisors, alumni, and staff, as well as your support communities, when I say that we are inspired and empowered by your individual and collective achievements. And I thank you for them. A few words more of thanks. Faculty members from diverse programs and departments at CCA, as well as scholars and artists from other institutions and organizations, some of whom I see here in the room and welcome today, um, have contributed to your preparedness to as assume key professional roles after you graduate. The effectiveness of this teamwork attests to the disciplinary diversity and collaborative character of the visual and critical studies enterprise. We are profoundly grateful for these collaborations and as well the advocacy of the humanities and sciences division under the leadership of Dean Juvenal Acosta, backed up by Mike Rothfeld, assistant director. The quality of our experience and of this symposium and of the VCS program by extension is also due in no small measure to the program manager. Sienna Freeman, herself a VCS dual degree alumna, <laughs> assumed this crucial role only last fall. Her professionalism and commitment to VCS impresses us daily, her sense of humor also. Um, her conscientiousness, resourcefulness, patience, generosity of spirit, administrative prowess, plate juggling in other words, and creative thinking have pushed this program forward during a year where everything, including the VCS curriculum, seems to be in transition. In closing, a shout out to Viet Le, the thesis director responsible for training students in the arts of formal presentation, among other things. This uh, symposium evidences his talent and dedication and Viet um, will now um, introduce uh, the, the, or the VCS um, symposium moderators to whom we also extend sincere thanks. And each moderator will then um, introduce the students on, on the panel. Um, and for you know, uh, um, information about the um, the timing and the breaks um, and um, deeper uh, information bios and information about the students' work um, and their, um, their allegiances and um, debts of gratitude, uh, I, I urge you to consult um, the program. Thank you. Hi, welcome, happy Earth Day. 
I also want to thank all of you, family, friends, colleagues, for being here today, and echo Terza's thanks uh, for her leadership, Sienna also for her leadership in keeping this boat together, um, Kevin the tech person, of course the 2017 cohort, Huvenal, Mike, uh, there's so many cliches, it takes a village, it's a labor of love. But in the very beginning days of the semester, uh, after, you know, on the verge of Brexit, after the news of the new administration, we're all thinking about why does art and writing matter? And some voice that it seemed uh, unnecessary. And, you know, what does it mean to be writing and making art in this time? Artist Dinkule, um, artist, scholar, and activist, no relation. He says, artists are public intellectuals. And so this cohort, for me, is the very best embodiment of what public engagement, um, activism, art, and writing can do through their work, which bridges creative and critical work, and also the personal and political and profound ways they really embody what it means to make work um, that matters. Dori Laub, um, psychoanalyst, theorist, and trauma theorist, she says that as a witness, the witness is always waiting for someone to hear, to witness. Uh, and so in this moment of witnessing, I guess you are the witnesses, but they've been working on their thesis presentations. These segments are only a segment, an excerpt of which you'll be hearing today. And so thank you for being part of this. And so again, how and why does writing matter? For now, it is more urgent than ever. So thank you, welcome. And I would also like to welcome Karen Fiss, uh, our first moderator for today. And so our first panel is uh, Invisible Bodies, Disease, Exhaustion, and Affects. Karen Fiss is a writer and curator whose current research examines national branding and the visual production of citizenship and collective memory in the wake of political upheaval or trauma. Recent projects include Necessary Force, Art in the Police State with Kim Pinder at the UNM Art Museum, Blue Flowers in Catastrophic Landscape, Grand Illusion, the Third Reich at the Paris uh, Exposition and Curatorial Seduction of France at the University, which is a book at University of Chicago Press. It's really hard to read up here because the light. My eyes are getting old also. Um, Prior to teaching, Fiss worked with the Institute of Contemporary Arts London and the New Museum in New York. She received her PhD from Yale University and her BA from Brown. So please welcome Karen. Yeah, wasn't kidding about the light. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning to introduce three very, uh, inspiring speakers and really interesting uh, topics and talks that they've come up with. Um, I've really enjoyed um, getting to know them and their work. Uh, so for our panel today, Invisible Bodies, Disease, Exhaustion, and Affect, um, all our students are, I mean, all the speakers are dual de degree students, candidates for both the MFA in studio practice and the MA in Visual and Critical Studies. So our first speaker is Jamie Cruzan, um, who is an interdisciplinary artist and writer with a double BFA from the Cleveland Institute of Art. Their work engages contemporary takes on queer exhaustion, traumatic relationship breakdowns, unavoidable melancholy, and the nonsensical nature of it all. Uh, Cruzan is exhibited across the United States, including Fused, SoMarts, and SoEx. In 2016, they received the Barclay Simpson Award, and on April 26th, they will be participating in the Emerging Scholars Program organized by the Queer Cultural Center. Yay. <laughs> Their presentation today focuses on the art practice of Cassils, queer, queer exhaustion, desire, and disorientation. Our second speaker will be Kristen Landowski, who is an Oakland-based artist, educator, and writer. She received her dual degree BFA in ceramics and sculpture and an art history minor from University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. 
Her work delves into the intersections of women's identity and body issues involving disease, particularly the representation of breast cancer in popular culture and in fine art, as well as trauma and objection. She has exhibited work locally in the Bay Area and across the United States, and currently teaches ceramics classes at the Richmond Art Center and Center for Community Arts in Walnut Creek. Kristen's talk today is titled, Picturing Disease: Advertising Breast Cancer in Pink Ribbon Culture and the Final Works of Joe Spence. And our last speaker on the panel this morning is Lindsay Tunkel, who's a multimedia conceptual artist and writer with a BFA from CalArts. She uses performance, interactive objects, and one-on-one -on -one encounters to explore subjects as diverse as the apocalypse, heartbreak, space travel, and death. Tunkel's work has been shown at the Hammer Museum in LA, the Center for Contemporary Art in Santa Fe, and Performance Space London. In, in 2016, she was the recipient of the Barclay Simpson Award and the CCA All, Connor, uh, All College Honors Award. And later this year, she'll be publishing her book, When You Die, You Will Not Be Scared to Die. And that will be with Parallax Press. And her talk today is Tragic Optimism, Angst, Affect, and Affirmation in the Works of Dario Robleto and Felix Gonzalez Torres. Um, and after the presentations, we'll have some time for a discussion amongst the three panelists. Um, and then I'll open it up to questions to the audience. Uh, but first, I'd like to invite Jamie up uh, to start with their presentation. Living in a world where one's love is abnormal and deviant, a club like Pulse offers a safe place away from those who choose to condemn our love simply because we love and desire differently. The film 103 Shots by Castles responds to the Pulse massacre and to the disorientation created when fear and anxiety impede expressions of love under the eye of violence. Castles' work confronts queer desire, homophobic and transphobic violence while testifying to the struggle and endurance it takes to sit outside the hetero and homonormative structure of the binary. Peggy Phelan writes in Morning Sex, quote, queers are queer because we recognize that we have survived our own deaths. The law, the social has already repudiated us, spit us out, banished us, jailed us, and otherwise quarantined us from the cultural imagination it is so anxious to keep clean, pristine, and well-guarded, end quote. On June 12, 2016, 103 shots were fired. Omar Mateen entered Pulse, a gay nightclub on Latin night in Orlando, Florida, killing 49 people and injuring 53 others. The 103rd shot is for Mateen's life. When I heard what had happened, I was sitting at my parents' home in a small coal mining town in western Pennsylvania, where my partner at the time and I were visiting. She sat on the couch watching MSNBC panicked. I had no words to console her simply because I had not understood what had just happened. She felt horrified, saddened, scared, and disoriented in rural Pennsylvania with a partner who was unable to offer her any emotional support. She excused herself and went upstairs. My mother looked at me and asked, what's wrong with her? 
At that moment, I felt as though I had been punched in the stomach. I felt numb, had nowhere to turn. I had inadvertently been confronted by my mother with my invisibility as a trans-identifying person, the invisibility of my love, while simultaneously realizing that those people in Orlando could have been me, my friends, or my lover. The term queer exhaustion has been in the vernacular of queer discourse for quite some time. I'm adapting the term to outline a theory of queer exhaustion that names the stressful dialectic of social and political visibility and invisibility as experienced by queer, trans, and intersex individuals in contemporary American culture. Queer exhaustion is the endless struggle between self-erasure and self-abnegation driven by continually negotiating hegemonic histories, desires, and experiences. This negotiation between invisibility and visibility require those outside of the heteronormative construct to pivot on a dime for their safety. This continual swivel and whirl create disorientation. Today, I'll be examining the disorientation found in queer exhaustion and found in Castle's 103 shots. By further examining disorientation, can it create an entrance for empathy? By empathy, I mean in the most basic sense sharing feelings of the other by providing a feeling of oneness. I suggest Castles activates empathy in 103 shots. The sharp cuts and assaulting sound disorient the senses, creating a sense of embodiment in the viewer. A few weeks after the shooting at Pulse, I attended San Francisco Pride. Pride was supposed to be a celebration. However, surrounded by the gaze of snipers perched on the tops of buildings surrounding Dolores Park, I watched two individuals pronounce their love to one another and get engaged under the protection of those guns. Being protected by the same weapons of war used to kill our companions creates disorientation. Both psychic and physical distresses are implicit in the idea that people need to be protected in order to celebrate and proclaim their love. Also under the watch of those snipers during Pride was Castles filming participants for 103 shots. Couples participating were asked to stand far enough apart for a white balloon to occupy the space between them. The weight of the couple's bodies provided just enough resistance so the balloon did not fall. The flexible rubber structure when filled allows for pressure to be applied. Once positioned in front of the stark white background face to face anchoring the gaze of intimacy, the couples tighten their embrace. The gesture of an embrace encourages someone to hold tight. The expression of an embrace cr implies crossing a distance to visibly show love's existence, romantic or otherwise. The balloon is an object of celebration and seems harmless. The action of the embrace implies affection or love, so when the embrace or loving gesture causes a pop that mimics a gunshot, disorientation occurs. Since emotions are directed by what we come into contact with, it is these emotions that move us toward or away from certain objects. When the couples make the choice to embrace, bodies come together, bursting the fragile balloon that was keeping them apart. Unsure of when the balloon will burst, the participants' reactions in 103 shots vary from pleasure to pain. Apprehension becomes visible as grimaces, closed eyes, tense jaws, and indirect gazes, as some embrace quickly, some slowly, and others reluctantly. Mimicking feelings of pleasure and pain, sexual orgasm and falling in love, the explosiveness of what happens when a balloon is suddenly put under too much pressure is both exciting and frightening. As the viewer, scenes alternate from close-ups of faces and contracting muscles. The sound of the bursting balloon causes one to blink hard and recoil, like when you hear a gunshot or pots and pans drop to the floor. Your chest tightens and fills with fear. The wider shots of the initial embrace reveal the collapsing bodies as the balloon burst. The burst balloon ejects from in between the couples, just like a bullet from a gun. The increasing cadence of the exploding balloons creates a pulse that runs through the film, and these pops and undertones are how the bodily awareness is activated within the viewer. Substitutions and changes of positionality open the possibility of creating empathy that was absent, and in this change, the viewer becomes a witness. Before fading to black, a person's face looks anguished. Witnessing this loss, you realize you've just watched an evocation of the disorientation that occurred that night when there was no distance or separation between lover or beloved or life and death. It is this shift in positionality that creates empathy. We consume desire, we resist it, fight against it, and we'll go to any lengths to even destroy it. We desire to be desired, we desire connectivity. 
There is an unease in the relationship one has with desire, including the distance one must traverse to act upon it. There are multiple ways one can desire, and this film underlines the beauty and tragedy or the pleasure and pain of queer desire. Fragility in the balloon creates a point at which it does break. The balloon ruptures. It breaks. It breaks up and breaks apart. Grief, trauma, and loss seemingly break apart all in its wake, especially after the loss of a loved one via breakup, breakdown, or death. The sensation of the exploding balloon, the sudden rush of adrenaline mirrors the rush after orgasm or the anxiety created when one is unsure of when the balloon will rupture. The sudden loss that occurs can be both pleasurable and painful when the distance bet between bodies collapse. Through disorientation, one gains another, and it is through the empathy created within 103 shots that allows people to become a witness to the testimony of queer love and loss not implicated in its destruction and refusal. In 103 shots, the balloon acts as a stand-in for a multitude of things keeping lovers or family apart. Belief systems, fear of loss, miscommunication. To explain or understand the barrier, one must break up and relinquish the most familiar parts of oneself in order to truly know someone. If one is to truly know the other, one must embrace the disorientation that comes with these things. 103 shots shows the struggle and disorientation that occurs when fighting against what normal modes deem the right way to love or to come into being. To quote Butler, quote, for if I am confounded by you, then you are already of me, and I am nowhere without you. I cannot muster the we except by finding the way in which I am tied to you, by trying to translate but finding that my language must break up and yield if I am to know you. You are what I gain through this disorientation and loss, this is how the human being comes into being again and again is that which we have yet to know, end quote. Language must break up and yield, leaving one speechless, for there are no words to encompass trauma, loss, or grief. Perhaps it is empathy, perhaps it is exactly this, knowing there will be moments with unfulfilled hope, incomprehensible pain, and perhaps having someone show up as your companion and being allowed to know you is what we gain. There's tremendous importance in having someone show up as your companion, someone who's allowed to witness your exhaustion, your pain and disorientation. How can one ever orient themselves again after such loss? Paul's pride, a family's home, are supposed to be safe places. However, when you have nowhere you can truly feel safe and seen, this is exhausting. Returning to the story of when I first heard about the Orlando shooting, I needed my partner. Uh, but I also needed to be a partner. I needed to bear witness to her pain and disorientation. I needed to see her struggle, to fully come face to face with the invisibility of my desire and love to my family. But I failed to fully witness my partner, just as my mother failed to see us, to see me. By making our way through disorientation, we find where and who we come to feel at home with. In witnessing others' pain and trauma, we come to know our own. The dilemmas of love and desire don't yield simple answers, for they create feelings of attachment. And in these feelings of attachment and love, one realizes there is potentiality for great loss. While the couples in 103 shots stand within reach of one another, the distance between threatens to divide, rendering the chance to embrace slipping away and falling out of reach. 103 Shots asks us to hold tight to one another in the face of fear, suffering, and great loss. The idea of embracing through the giant unexpected pop <laughs> is asking us to not let go, but in fact squeeze harder. As if I am looking at you, asking you to not let go of me, no matter how scary and hard it all becomes, even if I die here in your arms, don't let go. Thank you. One in eight women will develop breast cancer in her lifetime. This is the current statistic. In the 1970s, it was one in nine, and it fueled the beginning of a national health campaign organized to increase awareness of the disease and raise funds for the cure. 
Since 1985, the month of October has been devoted to breast cancer awareness. I will be exploring how breast cancer is blatantly appropriated by companies like Dyson and Target in 2007 that pinkwash products to capitalize on visual representations of breast cancer to support conventional standards of female beauty. In her book, Cancer Journals, Audre Lorde states, women have been programmed to view their bodies only in terms of how they look and feel to others rather than how they feel to themselves. Women are surrounded by media images portraying women in essentially decorative machines of consumer function. In comparison, I will examine how Joe Spence, an artist living with breast cancer at the time of making this work and died in 1992, rejects the conventional vision of female beauty while illustrating her own mortality and body image in the series Pictures of Health from 1982 to 1986 and her series Narratives of Disease from 1990. In this comparison, I argue that supporting the positivity of the pink ribbon culture perpetuates stereotypes of how the female body is accepted and subverts the patient's personal narrative, leaving us with a tyranny of cheerfulness. The Dyson and Target ad on the left is, de is designed to preserve conventional ideals of how the female body is to be read, which is apparent when we compare it to the Singer vacuum cleaner ad from the 1950s. Both reinforce heteronormative idea of the woman's place is in the home. Each ad incorporates whiteness, youth, thinness, and urban chic as core examples of the ideal female body. Both of these women have the state-of-the-art vacuum cleaner to keep their perfectly manicured home tidy. Note their shoes, which are not exactly the best shoes for cleaning. The white Maltese at left a reference to domesticity returns the viewer's gaze. It's wearing a pink bow, the icon for the pink ribbon culture. Social scientist Gail Sulik states, the pink ribbon symbolizes breast cancer awareness, but also functions as a summarizing image of a multitude of shifting meanings. In the context of the pink ribbon culture, the ribbon refers to core American beliefs about optimism, scientific progress, generosity, and the ability to rise to any challenge. I am not for any moment insinuating that raising money to cure breast cancer is anything but positive, and I applaud nonprofit organizations that are fundraising to support this research. However, corporations do not distribute notification when they have reached their capped donation amounts. In this promo at left, Dyson and Target we're promising that for every Dyson DC-07 vacuum cleaner sold in 2007, they would donate 10% of the purchase price to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. This leaves the remaining 90% as profit, and when the cap is met, 100% gain. Further, I would argue that this call to action patronizes the ill and diseased women that is supposedly benefiting because of its narratives of positivity through consumerism. The phrase pinkwashing, coined by the grassroots education and activist organization Breast Cancer Action, located in San Francisco. This term is also used in LGBTQIA community, but in a different context, regarding political and public rela relations strategies. In the US and other countries, the context of pride parades and other modes of support for the LGBTQI agendas, the pink dollar diverts attention from human right abuses. Within breast cancer community in the United States, pink washing refers to corporations that control the broader public conception of, pink, of breast cancer, obscuring environmental and chemical causes of the disease, some of which they are directly linked and responsible for. In 2012, Avon leveraged the pink ribbon to advertise their breast cancer research initiative, Breast Cancer Crusade, to fight the war on cancer. Avon is strategic in this ad with respect to playing on the emotions of the customer by naming their shades of lipstick, courage, hope, faith, passion, and honesty. 
I would argue that this deployment of the pink ribbon perpetuates the anti-feminist idea that a woman has to be carefully packaged and made up by a conventional standards to be acceptable. In 2011, just one year before this ad came out, environmental justice named Avon's Kiss Goodbye to Breast Cancer campaign as one of the company's most poignant instances of pink washing. It was designed to raise funds for breast cancer research but many of their shades of lipstick were suspected of containing hormone disrupting ingredients linked to causing breast cancer. The use of the pink ribbon is ubiquitous. How many different ways can we fight this disease? Is it with the football, pink football attire from the National Football League, who is supported by American Cancer Society, funded by AstraZeneca, largest creator of breast cancer drugs, bring awareness? Or perhaps painting 1,000 fracking bits used by Baker Hughes that damage land and release cancer-causing toxins can help as they support Susan G. Komen. Or the pink buckets for a cure from Kentucky Fried Chicken. Or is it your place, Save Lids for Cancer, that contain hormone-altering chemicals linked to causing breast cancer? This campaign benefited Susan G. Komen, who also threatened to defund their support of Planned Parenthood in 2012 that conflicted with corporate sponsor ideals. Clearly, the Burst of Thunder 380 Breast Cancer Awareness Kit can help fight the war on breast cancer. <laughs> corporate sponsorships for nonprofit organizations demonstrate who has the power in marketing, namely not the person with cancer. Joe Spence's work, with, which predates the pink ribbon culture of walk, run, races for the cure, is an alternative to the constructed positivity of the pink ribbon culture and ad campaigns. Her stage self-portraits explore illness and reject the conventional vision of female beauty and that the pink ribbon culture reinforces. Here we see the artist herself nude, her white aging torso contrast dramatically with the fit white woman you recall from the pristinely crafted Dyson Target ad. She gently holds the ribbon in her middle finger and thumb. The breasts in the booby prize written on the side of the ribbon are asymmetrical and cartoony. At first glance they look like eyes staring back at us. To keep our eye on the prize is a goal and the awards are noble. However this is a prize for monstrosity which I will discuss is seen as unknowable. This is a prize for the diseased. It acknowledges that patients living with cancer are given labels such as survivor. It invokes the reality of knowing that you are not in control of your diagnosis and the anguish of realizing that the treatment you are about to undergo to save your life is harmful. According to Michel Foucault, the medical gaze refers to the construction of the body as an object of visual scrutiny within medical science. From her series, A Picture of Health, focuses on infantilization, denying maturity, and treating someone like a child. Spence does not possess the power of diagnosing or expunging the tumor that is growing in her breast. Through photography, Spence is documenting her own experience, just as doctors document an illness, only here, she is controlling the visualization of her body through her own eyes that are staring back at the viewer and her own narrative. Spence rejects any attempt to make this easy for the viewer, as we have seen in the pink ribbon culture. She has not applied makeup. She is not smiling. She does not beautify this moment of contemplation. Illness becomes narratives very quickly. In her book published in 1978, Illness is Metaphor, Susan Sontag discusses how metaphors associated with disease stigmatize that disease and the ill. Building upon these ideas, in 1997, feminist theorist Jackie Stacy wrote Teratologies, a cultural study of cancer, which discusses how disease is perceived, experienced, and how it is a cultural phenomenon. According to the Oxford Dictionary, teratology means the scientific study of abnormalities and abnormal functions. The prefix terato means relating to monsters or abnormal forms. The origin of this word is Greek, terat, meaning monster. 
The suffix elegy is medical jargon that means a branch of knowledge. If Spence is interested in putting herself in as the subject of study to contend with her disease, then she is equating herself to being a monster in this series. Here we see Spence nude, with the exception of the word monster written in an arc above her breasts. The word indicates conflict, not only regarding how she perceives herself, but how she will be perceived by society. The hint of the mask is reminiscent of the Phantom of the Opera. By opening her medical gown, spreading her arms, and exposing her body like a flasher to an unsuspecting crowd, she reveals the difference in her breasts. This is the body the pink ribbon culture cannot sell. We return to the plush, cozy, authoritative chair that declares the power of pink. The chair refer references the corporate boardroom and the patriarchal power of administration. These are the powers that are actually control and limit women, whether they are knowingly selling them harmful chemicals for consumption, or withholding the option to reserve birth control, or wielding a Foucauldian power of knowledge of the disease and authority in diagnosis. I propose we should think before we pink. In Expunge, Spence shows us precisely the area that was removed from view in the Dyson Target ad, namely the diseased breast, making breast cancer visible. This challenges the naming convention of survivor by instead awarding herself the booby prize and naming her doctor as co-artist. The Pink Ribbon Campaign proposes that women must always be happy, even in the face of their own mortality. This tyranny of cheerfulness put forth by the Pink Ribbon culture with the omnipresent pink products are condescending and harmful to people living with cancer. The battle and survivor terminology leaves us with what Jackie Stacy calls a, a story of heroes, victims, and villains. The Pink Ribbon's culture space of constructed positivity denies the alternative narrative that is anger of the disease. Thank you. In 1996, Dario Robledo entered his university library and began searching through books for references to the end of the world. He systematically altered with white out and pen all the dates referencing Armageddon by adding 100 years. In the text that represents the piece, Robledo writes that this project will continue indefinitely until he is satisfied all references have been changed. He also wrote that the action was taken in an effort to buy us all a little more time. He titled the work, Tonight I'm Gonna Party Like It's 2099, a riff off of Prince's top hit and Y2K anthem, 1999. Robledo does not tell us the specifics of how he found the books, how many he altered, or if the project continues to this day, allowing the work to exist somewhere between the concrete and the speculative. On the surface, the work reads as an attempt to save the world, but within deeper analysis, it is clear that it isn't really a refusal of the end. Rather, it is a surrender coupled with a tender gesture that intently accepts that someday the world is going to end, but off also offers a consolation, a little more time. Robledo is a self-identified tragic optimist and materialist poet whose massive archive of work ranges in subject matter from pop music to dinosaur extinction, space travel to teenage heartbreak. Each piece resonates deeply with a few pertinent concerns, love, loss, longing, and art as a means towards healing from despair. Within Robledo's practice, love doesn't just refer to romantic love, it extends much farther to the love we feel for our fellows, for the world, for art, for songs that become anthems, for idols that place us in the role of unrelenting fans, and moments both banal and profound that suspend us in awe. For example, in I Won't Let You Say Goodbye This Time, Robledo sought out tomato seedlings that had been floating in space on the Challenger shuttle for six years and then tended to them until they sprouted, naming each after the fallen astronauts from the Challenger disaster. 
or in the 1998 work entitled Patsy Spool, Robletto spliced a single vinyl record of Patsy Cline's song, I Fall to Pieces, on the seams to make one long thread and then spun that thread around a spool and gave it a sewing needle. In each of these works, something is taken apart, sampled, and transformed in an effort to execute a reparation. The pieces fall back together, stunted, pe stunted seeds get to grow, and when Robletto searches through the stacks at the library, altering dates to give us more time, he doesn't succeed, but he does give his time, and that counts for something, even though it probably does nothing. For as long as I can remember, the overall thrusting question for my work as a maker, writer, and viewer has been, what can art teach us about being human in a world that is uncertain, scary, and more often than not, heartbreaking? The uncertainty of life and the tragedies that occur on both intimate scales and large societal ones undoubtedly cause grief, and humans have the common propensity to question the meaning and purposes of such occurrences like loss of a loved one or war or natural disasters. The despair that arises when one cannot make meaning of such events, when there is no meaning to justify profound suffering. This is what Friedrich Nietzsche defined as nihilism and what he spent his career as a philosopher trying to understand. Nietzsche looking to answer a question similar to mine, what can art do for us in the face of certain meaninglessness, wrote his first book, The Birth of Tragedy in 1872. The book is a philosophical consideration of art that could be characterized as a love letter to his contemporary Richard Wagner. Nietzsche championed Wagner's music for exemplifying a composition of aesthetics in a, that could succeed in affirming life's value in the face of nihilist despair by performing a synthesis of the Apollonian and Dionysian aesthetics, a doubling of oppositional yet complementary affects such as tragedy and beauty or desire and fear. The concept of the Apollonian and Dionysian originate from Greek mythology's Apollo and Dionysus, sons of Zeus. Z Apollo is the god of rationality, logic, and reason. Dionysus is the god of impracticality, irrationality, and chaos. While their traits are oppositional, the Greeks did not perceive them as opposing forces. They were embraced as intertwined and harmonious. Nietzsche further illuminates the nuances within the Apollonian and Dionysian while focusing much of his writing on the opera Tristan and Isolde, which has since been written about extensively. Contemporary philosopher Brian McGee writes, the first chord of Tristan and Isolde remains the most famous single chord in the history of music. It contains within itself not one but two dissonances, thus creating within the listener a double desire, agonizing in its intensity for resolution. The chord to which it then moves resolves one of these dissonances, but not the other, thus providing resolution yet not resolved. This double desire that McGee refers to is synonymous with Nietzsche's Apollonian and Dionysian and is from where I extend my analysis. I will examine the works of Robletto and his artistic influence, Felix Gonzalez Torres, within this frame to illustrate how art and its practice can in fact ease the ache of certain meaninglessness. One can see the Apollonian and Dionysian synthesis present in Robletto's Tonight I'm Gonna Party Like It's 2099. The work was not shown publicly until 2008 and until then was solely intended for those who might unexpectedly come upon these subtle interventions, for the student researching global warming or for the teacher preparing a lecture on religion. In an intimate moment with a trace of another's hand in the midst of a public place of research, there is a tension that is sparked by the simple anonymous gesture that simultaneously eludes and gives. The work is funny but remains earnest. It is realistically ineffectual but unimaginably time consuming. It references pop culture while engaging in humanity's very real fear of the end. It is vandalism but it is also a remedy. It is tragic and futile and completely satisfying. What McGee and Nietzsche are speaking to in the music of Tristan and Isolde without naming it, and what I am speaking to in Robletto's work is affect. The gathering of sensation, emotion, feeling, both physical and otherwise, and the movements in and around, through and beyond these states instigated by events, objects, and encounters. Nietzsche believed in art's ability to harness these affects to create a profound and curative experience for the viewer. For him, it was Wagner who succeeded in this task. For me, it is Robletto. For Robletto, it is Felix Gonzalez Torres. 
In 2001, Robledo wrote an essay about Gonzalez Torres that could be characterized as a love letter titled, When You Cry, I Only Love You More. Robledo writes, it amazes me that his work can so amorphously adapt to any pain or joy that enters my life. If art can be anything, it must be this. As a Cuban-American gay man making work about his loves and losses in the 1990s, citing the AIDS crisis as an incomprehensible reality, Felix Gonzalez Torres used his great disappointment in the world around him to operate within a strategic framework of harmonious opposition. Gonzalez Torres made prolific artworks often categorized as minimalist, reflecting on varied content such as capitalism, loss, violence, and love. Robledo has made artwork out of the artifacts of Gonzalez Torres' takeaway works, illuminating a similar dynamic to that of Nietzsche and Wagner. Robledo's 1997 work, I Miss Everyone Who Has Ever Gone Away, is made of candy wrappers from Gonzalez Torres' sculptural work, untitled USA Today, which you'll see in a moment. Robledo folded the candy wrappers into airplanes and then hung them from the ceiling with white thread, emulating fighter jets caught mid-flight. Tiny metallic, metallic specks of red, blue, and silver collect in a suspended cloud. Their colors signify the American dream, air shows, and sunny days at the carnival. Untitled USA Today by Gonzalez Torres manifests as a large pile of candy spilled into the corner of a room. Again, the colors signify things closely linked to the American dream, but in this configuration, candy wrappers wrapping candy, the colors also hint at Memorial Day contests, half-off sales, and the American adage, go big or go home. Weighing 300 pounds at its initial installation, and again with every replenishment, the pile shrinks in between as viewers are invited to take as much candy as they like, devour it, and throw away the wrappers. 300 pounds is the combined weight of Gonzalez Torres and his lover Ross Laycock, measured soon before Laycock died of AIDS-related causes. Not much context is given, but the viewer might consider how light 300 pounds is for two men, though it makes sense if one of them is dying. In the moment, as a sugary communion of the dead is taken and taste buds are emboldened with sweetness, the body of someone's lover dissolves. The opposition of tactile enjoyment and metaphorical loss confront each other, and the affective qualities of the Apollonian and Dionysian synthesis are engaged. As viewers, we participate in love whether we intend to or not, and we participate in the disappearing of a lover as well. Gonzalez Torres's gesture compels us to ask what loss tastes like, what it smells like. It asks, how heavy is love? It compels us to reckon with affect, with our senses and emotion in a critical way. Gonzalez Torres writes about his works and the public interaction. Quote, perhaps between public and private, between personal and social, between fear of loss and the joy of loving, of growing, changing, of always becoming more, of losing oneself slowly and then being replenished all over again from scratch, I need the viewer. Without the public, these works are nothing. I need the public to complete the work. I ask the public to help me to take responsibility. By taking the candy wrappers from Gonzalez Torres's work and turning them into something new, Robledo replies to Gonzalez Torres's request with a clear and concise, yes, I will help. Yes, I will take responsibility. Yes, I will become a part of this work. Not only the artwork itself, but the work of affirming life's value in the midst of great and incomprehensible anguish. Robledo takes the candy wrappers and elevates them to a new height, communicating that the lessons of grief will not be wasted. They will mean something still long after the candy has dissolved on the tongue. In taking a closer look at the paper airplanes in Robledo's piece, one can see that some of these airplanes have been made from cut and reshaped pieces of foil. Some have been given wings that have been adhered with glue, creating a union between two distinct pieces. This gesture insists that the artifacts of loss can be pulled apart and recuperated by art. They are lifted up in monument as emblems for Gonzalez Torres and what he lived and died through, reminding us that while we will never learn to defy death, we have learned to defy gravity. In this, planes becomes metaphors for the tragedies that humanity has pushed to the other side of, for the histories of impossibilities becoming possible. The first airplane flight, the first space exploration, setting foot on the moon. They also signify the moments where humanity has failed itself, the Challenger disaster, the 9-11 attacks, the fact that airplanes are used to drop bombs. 
The same vessel that becomes an emblem of hope becomes an emblem of hopelessness, creating a space where tragic optimism must, must reside. These works ask the viewer to acknowledge that while the world is a tragic place, we can still have joy and laughter, and we can still be together, feeling awe as we see an airplane fly loop-de-loops over our heads, like the moment a crowd of strangers comes together, moved by one single chord. It's not that we need these representations to know these tragedies exist. It's that art as a form has the power to demand more than despair. These dualities will always be present, and when they can be present in one single moment, an embrace of everything. Despair is no longer despair as we know it, but despair as we need it, a moment of nourishment. Thank you. Well, oh, there you are. <laughs> um, thank you all for really engaging presentations and uh, so we have about 15 minutes for a uh, conversation. I thought I'd start it off with one general question to all three uh, panelists, and then I'll open it up uh, to you all for um, follow-up questions. Um, in looking at the notion of invisible bodies, uh, what I saw the three of you, uh, in a sense, um, uh, presenting to us as a possible role for artistic practice is that there's a space for it somehow to repair, um, to address injury, trauma, illness, meaninglessness, uh, but to do so without resolution, without kind of having it reconciled in kind of a neat package that the, there's a tension that still uh, exists and in that space it seems that's where you're finding um, this moment of hope or possibility um, or even a, a different kind of audience engagement. Um, and so in that sense, um, affect can be mobilized um, around the issues of identity and erasure um, and continue to demand uh, attention. And I think in the law of the social, um, as Jamie presented it, that kind of uh, tension would be seen as an oxymoron, like that terms that are seemingly in opposition aren't supposed to be able to coexist. But I think all of you are actually presenting that as a real uh, st strategy um, for artistic production. So maybe, um, uh, Lindsay, since your presentation is called Tragic Optimism, you might want to address that first. And then I thought, Kristen, you might want to talk about the fact that um, in Jo Spence's work, you actually say that she's deliberately playing on a double meaning of, of for example, the use of the word monster. And uh, for Jamie, that uh, in 103 shots, um, the the balloons popping that end up almost, you know, being edited in a way that they become an automatic rifle, uh, are not necessarily reenacting some kind of PTSD, but rather creating a space again for visibility and, and, and empathy. So I'll start with Lindsay. Thanks, Karen. Thank you for the great question. Um, and thank you to my other two wonderful panelists. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because it's, you said the word oxymoron, which kind of implies this like either or. And um, I think that what all of our presentations really kind of um, focus on is that it's, it's not either or, it's like many things, many things, many forms of meaning, many things that are unfolding over time. Um, like how does context fit in? How does the identity of a maker fit in? Um, all of these things and, and I think culturally and instinctually like we have a desire to put a stamp on something so we know what it is and um, it's either you're, you're either a survivor or you're not you know like it's but but it's there's so many there's so much more in between and um, I think in that place where you can really see all of those things for what they are there's just so much more possibility and um, and and hope and hopelessness -ness. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, thank you. 
Thank you, both of you, and thank you, Karen, for the great question. It was great. It was an honor to be on the same panel as you guys. Um, in relation to Spence's work, uh, she was creating her work during a time like in the, in the early in 1980s when breast cancer really wasn't discussed and talked about as much, and so. I started thinking about her work and how she was challenging stereo, you know, stereotypes of gender and class and the exploration of disease and like how she was using that work to actually help counsel and like get the word out there that there are different narratives than what they were being told. Um, but she, in relation to the word monster, um, as a cancer patient, that's how she saw herself perceived by others and just her experience of just being monstrous. So that was how she had started to use that word. And through the word of like using, t so in relation to teratology, you know, so that study of an abnormal, um, an abnormal function. So like within the body, having the failed gene or cell that starts to abnormally change within the body, um, you know, to actually cause that is like reflecting and representing like what happens, that imperfection of that duplication in the cells. So that's kind of like where I was starting to try to tie, tie those two things together. But for Spence, when she was making the work too, people were just like, how dare you put this work out there to see the pain? Um, they didn't want to bear witness to that or have to speak or see it. Um, so she was actually making those, you know, things that pe the feelings visible along with the visible, um, aspects and reflect, you know, reflections of breast cancer. Thank you to the panel, Karen, thank you. Hi guys, all out there, technology guys, thanks for showing up, thanks for coming. Um, I think for me it's about disorientation. I think it all, all everything is just, you know, everything revolves around disorientation because so much of visibility and invisibility is double-sided. Um, there's dangers that can happen physically and psychically with, with both of those things, as well as disorientation can be a physical thing and, a, and a, an emotional thing as well. Um, and I think that what Castle's work, Castle's work does primarily in all of their work is really kind of try to change the positionality of the viewer to witness so that they can actually have that sensation of maybe empathizing with the person that they're watching, the body being beat, the clay being transformed um, in their previous work. Um, yeah, so for me, I think it's, it's disorientation that kind of is that doubleness that without it, I don't really know how you can get to empathy through their, through their work. That embodiment makes you very aware of your own body. Yeah, that's uh, maybe you spoke. Um, and maybe just as a follow-up question for Jamie and then I'll open it up. Um, and this is something that you and I have talked just a bit about before um, in, uh, in a sense, creating that space of empathy through disorientation, so basically upsiding that heteronormative uh, balance um, or the appearance of balance. Um, I know Castles uh, in their film uh, feels that they're addressing um, and not trying to necessarily reconcile the historic erasure of brownness um, within representations of the LGBTQ community. Um, but given that the population at the Pulse nightclub um, was almost entirely Puerto Rican, um, I'm wondering if you maybe want to address how that plays into that space of disorientation in the film. Sure, I think that that's something that's, I mean, it's a great question. Um, that's something that, in speaking to Castles, they've actually really been giving a lot of thought to because it's something that, that they contend with in some of their previous work as well. Um, I think that they're really focusing on more, you know, this, of this idea of community and inclusivity um, and trying to really, in the black and white film, which this is the only film, the only colorless thing that they've ever actually made, um, is really kind of nodding to these you know, erasures, erased histories, um, the idea of, of black and white and, and gray being kind of infinite um, and it's, you know, it's kind of positionality within the, the grayness scale per se. Um, 
but yet to, uh, to address the, the brown bodies, I think that um, that's something that they're aware of, but I, I'm not quite sure that they're, they really know how to quite tackle that, that part of their, of their practice yet, being someone who is, who is white and contending with those kinds of conversations. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really powerful film. And then at the same time, there's like that Benetton, remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sort of, um, that's, but yeah, I think that's just a, a tension that exists that I actually don't think that one can reconcile in the way that systems of representation work. Yeah, and then we have to also think about you know the fact that it was at Dolores Park and you know during San Francisco Pride and people that didn't want to participate or did not want to participate. So yeah, you know so there were like, around 200 participants I think that were kind of edited down to the 103. Yeah, great. Well, thank you all. Um, and I know if yet standing by with a uh, 1.5 questions. Okay, um, who wants to be the one in the 0.5? Hi, uh, congratulations to you all. It's been a year since I was up there on that stage, so I know how you feel. <laughs> congratulations. So to Jamie, um, I'll ask the obvious question. Tell me about the tossing of your symposium script on the floor. Is that some kind of, is that a, a nod to you it's, being exhausted? It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, anytime I have to do anything in front of people, I think I'm exhausted. Um, it's kind of something that I've always done. Um, and luckily, it's the, the pops and the clicks on the floor kind of uh, just inter intertwined nicely with the presentation. So it's kind of a little bit of a queer that's exhausted and some uh, disorientation of my own that's happening. There's too many other things to contend with between buttons and papers. So Thanks, Veronica. Um. Okay, one more <laughs> question. Hi. Um, First of all, congratulations to all of you. You did fantastic jobs. Um, my question, I guess, is um, in all three projects, there's there's this sense of of urgency in all of the artists' work. And obviously, with Jamie's project, it's responding to something that has happened very recently. But in general, there seems to be the moments that they are all, all of these works are made are particularly, there's a particular tension that exists um, contextually. And so I was just wondering if you could speak to the urgency that you potentially feel in writing about this work right now. Um, how did you kind of deal with that in your, in your research and in your writing about these particular artists and these particular bodies of work? I'll tackle that one first. Um, so for myself, I mean, knowing the political climate that we're in, my thesis actually kept changing um, with, you know, talking about erasures and what kind of access to health care people are going to be having, which is a concern. Um, so that was something that, you know, we, that, that, as I'm going through this research, I feel like the conversations that we're having are still the same ones that they were, that Spence was having. They're just a little bit, they're slightly different at this point, um, but still having to, you know, bring awareness to, you know, the issues that are going on with the you know positivity of ribbons and as as they are positive, there are other things that are being covered up, um, and just like how she was trying to deal with you know using this information as counseling. And so for me, it's just trying to still show that there are alternatives to what is being shown now. You know that we've seen this incessant pink everywhere, but that we can still have different dialogues around it. Thanks, Elena, for the question. Um, I think my fascination with Robledo and then with Nietzsche has been the way that they, you know, all, all of these, you know, Trump getting elected, Pulse nightclub, breast cancer, these are all like profound experiences that are so disorienting and really make us all question like what is hap like what is meaning and like for Nietzsche it was the death of God it was culture realizing that everything that they had completely believed for hundreds of years was not true and uh, and we can look through history and see moments of that coming over and over and over again and um, it doesn't make the moment that we're in 
any less profound. It makes it more profound. It makes it urgent. But it, it, this is also something we're constantly dealing with. And how do we use tools like art and writing and, and conversation and talking to actually um, delve into those spaces and embrace it rather than being bewildered by it? And, and how do we stay affirming the value of our lives and, and the connections that we make in the midst of these things that are just devastating? And um, yeah, so I, I think both, I think Robletto tackles these things in a way that's accessible and also poignant and kind of more ethereal in a way that I think is really easily to access. Yeah, and I'll I'll jump on on that as well to kind of echo Lindsay. I think that that's the way that Caspels kind of works as well. Um, is that you know they are very very aware, uh, they're very timely in the work that they make. And I think with 103 shots, it was something that had to be made. It was made, I believe, it was two weeks after the shooting. So I think that that turnaround time is just a way of of creating that conversation that really needs to happen um, in a really timely fashion um, so that we're still talking about it. It's a work that's not really shown that much. It hasn't really been shown much, but it's something that's constantly in conversation so that two weeks from now, two weeks after it happened, it's now in an art context and it's kind of reaching people that maybe not would have been reached before. Let's thank our uh, panel number one.